Welcome to Life in Leadership with David Gadbury. We're excited that you're joining our leadership community. There's a lot of information about leadership, but a lot of times it's too sterile for real life. Life is messy and leadership can be messy. Here we talk about real leadership in the context of real life. If you're a leader looking for tips, insight, and wisdom on leadership, you can follow David on social media. And for upcoming group coaching experiences and more, go to gadberry.org. David is the lead pastor of Summit Church in Canyon, Texas, and we would love to invite you to be a part. For more information, go to yoursummitchurch.com. This is the Life and Leadership Podcast. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Life and Leadership with David Gadbury. I'm David Gadbury, and I'm so glad that you've joined us today, and I'm thankful that you're part of our leadership community. No matter where you're listening from all over the world, we're glad that you're a part of what we do here. You know, we believe at Life and Leadership in looking at leadership through a real-life lens. Real leadership in real life is very effective. I don't think we can look at it sterilely. We have to look at it in terms of all the mess that life brings and how it affects us and how we can succeed even in that context. Today, I'm going to be interviewing a man by the name of Jonathan Gardner, who's a young man who owns a company called Sound in Church. It's an incredible uh, company, and he's just a very interesting entrepreneur, along with his wife, who is is, uh, a real estate entrepreneur. And... Uh, You're going to enjoy every bit of this. You're going to take away powerful, practical nuggets that help you apply real leadership in real life. So thanks for being a part today. God bless. Hey, Jonathan, how's it going? Going great, Pastor David. How are you? I'm doing good. So you're calling in from Mexico. We want to just thank you for your time and being a part of our podcast today. So where in Mexico are you? Oh, man, it's a pleasure to be on the phone with you, Pastor David. I am calling in from the sunny, beautiful Puerto Morales, right on Cancun. We are experiencing a wonderful work trip with my wife, Jillian, and her company, ERA Courtyard, on the annual top agent trip, and it is just a beautiful blast. We are having a great time. Well, I hope you don't mind if I call you a punk because uh, that's how I feel about you right now. I'm friends with Jonathan, so don't worry about me calling him a punk. I'm just very jealous, and I think it's wrong. Uh, I appreciate you calling in, but you know, you could have said it's hot here and there's no fun at all, and I would have been feeling better. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's a lot of tough decisions that we have to make today. It's do we go to the pool? Do we go to the beach? Where do we eat? It's yeah. just a, it's kind of rough for this week. Yeah. You're, you're killing me smalls. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, so man, thank you so much really for being a part. And today we, you know, we just wanted to talk to you, uh, about real life and leadership and, um, uh, you know, we love what you do. We love what your wife does. Most importantly, we love you guys. You're, you are, just really positive, upbeat people. And, you know, we just love being around people like that and, and have worked with both of you in different settings. And you're just always so positive and the glass is always uh, half full with you guys. And I think that makes a huge difference in your business. And, um, you know, uh, we've worked with you a lot at, here at Summit Church and are continuing that relationship. And so, I wanted to talk a little bit to you. Uh, We're going to talk a little bit about what your wife does, and hopefully later we'll be able to get you both in a podcast live and uh, really kind of hash out some different success principles and thoughts on just entrepreneurial efforts and making your dreams come true and all that kind of thing. But today I just want to talk to you about some different things. And so I want to just start by uh, your your business is called Sound in Church, and uh, tell us what that is. Tell us what Sound in Church is all about. Yeah, well, we appreciate you guys. We appreciate and love Summit Church and always look forward to working with you and your team out in Canyon, Texas. And really what Sound in Church is, is a dream that God put upon my heart uh, about eight years ago, 
I'd spent a lot of time working in the secular world, doing live concert production, spending time in the recording studio, and just various venues where mission critical was the absolute requirement. And I spent many years and was able to gain a lot of experience, work with a lot of great class act artists. And it just led me to go from those experiences to the church that things were a volunteer basis. The equipment was hand me down. Uh, things were sort of patched together and for a while I was pretty frustrated with that. I was frustrated with the experience that these churches were having with less than quality sound. And, and I was really kind of a punk about it for a while. I was saying that I couldn't deal with the sound and I had to walk away and God really spoke to me. He humbled me and he gave me a vision to say, this is what I want to do. This is what I'm called to do. And I'm going to do this. And so sound in church is a, it's the fruition of God speaking a purpose from the talents that he gave me to the expectation that we should all have in church, which is to make the worship experience fantastic. Definitely. You know, just working with you guys, there's a sense of that, which I just got to tell you as a pastor, uh, it's very refreshing. I never, we never work with you and our, our creative uh, team never works with you where we've, I feel uh, concerned about getting things for no reason or being led to do things that are beyond what we need or anything like that. And the, the trust factor, because you do have a vision for what you're trying to accomplish is just, it's amazing uh, because it, it gives you the freedom to say, Hey, they care about what, what we're accomplishing here. It's not just about uh, selling us something. And, you know, when, when the last time you came down and you just ran sound for us and kind of trained some of our guys and just, uh, it, it was just such a almost a symbiotic relationship uh, in that sense where um, there's just a real harmony in it. I don't know that that sounds weird when you're talking about production and working mm -hmm. with, but it really was like that. And I, and I really appreciate and enjoy that. And, uh, you're not just saying, Hey, here's some stuff. When you want us to come work on it, let us know. It's more of a, Hey, we want to work with you. Uh, we believe. So I want to ask you a question about that because you, you said, you know, I've had this dream. God called me to do this. Uh, but you know, every leader I know the, the motivation, the thing that, that burns in them is the why behind that. So why is that so important mm -hmm. to you? I mean, I heard you say it a while ago, and I could hear a, a bit of intensity in your tone just about the the worship experiences and uh, the whole idea of sound in church. So why? Why is it so important? Yeah, I mean, that's that's a great question. I I think that it's so important because for the longest time, high quality sound was important in my world for other reasons. It was important for a promoter to be able to sell a certain amount of tickets. It was important for the band to play for a sold out audience. It was important for many reasons that really didn't have anything to do for a kingdom purpose. And it just became it became frustrating to see such a disparity in the quality. And I realized that churches are, are limited with certain budget restrictions, but we shouldn't be limited in the efforts that we put forth to make quality sound reinforcement. Right. Because you could take, 
a talented musician and put them on a stage and they could do a, a festival for a county fair and you could take that same musician and put them on stage in a worship band. And the same holds true for an audio guy. So like we have to be working as hard as we can to, to just make the church be as pleasant of an experience as possible. I say this to a lot of different texts in churches that I visit. It's that obviously we're, we have the best product and I realize do not get me wrong in the semantics of this comment, but like we're selling Jesus, right? We are making it clear the message of the gospel. We are trying to make, in my opinion, when somebody walks into the church and the pastor is on stage or the worship band is playing a song, it should be pleasant. Now, right. obviously there are certain opinions on volume and this kind of thing. I'm not here for that. But what I'm saying is that there should be a certain expectation of quality. And right. so many times we just say, well, you know, they're volunteers or they're this or they're that. And it's like, okay, I get that. And we need volunteers and we need people that have a passion for this, but let's give them the tools that right. we can give them because there are tools that are within the reach of every church. Right. And that's one of the things that I feel like God's also led me to be very creative and resourceful on getting these tools into churches. And so to answer your question, the why is that it's just the way it should be. It just should be good in church. Yeah, right. It should. I mean, I think really what you're saying, and and I completely agree uh, with it, is we have this propensity to sometimes, and I don't want to generalize or broad stroke this, but there is a propensity sometimes because you know, in churches, it's a nonprofit thing. And so the, the majority of people serving are, are volunteers. And as a result mm-hmm. of that, it, it's almost like we make excuses because of that. When the truth is right. most people want to have expectations and they want you to expect things of them. And most of the time, if you do have expectations for them, they will exceed those expectations. But I think it comes down to how how do we approach um, churches as in contrast to other things? Like, you know, is it, do we really approach our worship in church uh, with excellence, or is it more of a feeling of well, it's just church? And um, mm-hmm. that should never. I always tell our serve team and I tell our staff, don't ever, <laughs> don't ever bring that to me. That's I don't get mad easy, but mm-hmm. that. That, that kind of ra- causes a righteous indignation to rise in me because this, I mean, we're doing this for God. Now, I, I, I again, I understand, believe me, the budget restrictions and all of that, but there's almost no excuse nowadays because of the yeah. uh, digital age and because things technologically are within most people's reach to some degree and, it, and, and they can do something of quality and excellence. And so I really appreciate your why behind that, because it's for God. It's to lead people into Mm -hmm. the presence of God. And so there should be a high level of excellence. Matter of fact, in my estimation, and of course, people would expect me to say this because I'm a pastor, but in my estimation, it should be the highest expectation and highest levels of excellence. And that is not perfection. We we realize we're not going to get to perfection, but excellence is doing the very best that you can with what you've been given. And so um, I think that it's within our reach if we'll just start thinking differently. I really appreciate that answer. And especially coming from someone in your field, uh, I like the way that you have a ministry mindset. So uh, I just want to say this before we go on to the next question. For anybody who might be watching this or listening to this podcast and you're a pastor or a leader uh, I'm not, we didn't do this podcast to, to promote Jonathan or his business or anything like that, but I don't have any problem doing that. And, uh, he would have, he didn't have any idea I was going to do it, but I'm, I'm doing it because I believe in the way he approaches this and you can trust that he's trying to help you not 
just in selling you equipment, but he's trying to help you in getting the, the quality that is right for you, right for your church and right for the kingdom of God. And so, uh, I'm just telling you, you know, look up sound in church and I'm sure we'll pop up the website or put it on the, the podcast, but, uh, and check it out because I'm telling you, they can help you in, in more ways than one. It's not just about equipment. It, the, the consulting part of it is very good. So Jonathan, um, to be a little bit more secular now and more business driven, uh, what's your greatest challenge when it comes to to managing your business businesses and family? So before we get into that, tell me a little bit about Jillian and uh, just her near superstar status as a real estate <laughs> agent. Tell us a little bit about her business and we'll talk more about that with her later, but um, tell us a little bit about that uh, so we can get a context before you answer this next question. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for the kind words about Sound and Church. I do appreciate it. And I, I really value your trust very much, Pastor David. Um, so my wife, Jillian Gardner, she is a agent at ERA Courtyard in Oklahoma City and been selling residential real estate in the OKC area for nearly 12 years, I believe. Been in a few different offices and you talk about a people person with <laughs> a motivation for just absolute 100% customer satisfaction in transactions that are most likely the biggest purchases that anybody's ever going to experience. She's just driven to find the perfect house to negotiate. She's a fantastic negotiator. She's able to communicate certain deals in this for people that haven't purchased a home before and even for people that have, there are so many different areas where you could dig in and negotiate certain facets of this transaction to really make it beneficial for all parties. It's not like she's just going to take the seller to the cleaners and <laughs> make it where the, right. the buyer just gets a steal, but she's able to think very creatively and work certain things out with her network of uh, title uh, companies and with other lenders and the relationship that she has with her broker is phenomenal. And so all of these things are just very key, not to mention the whole uh, technological uh, products that are available uh, to her, which are ultimately available to her clients that her company has invested in that just set your listing. If you're selling your house apart from many other listings and that also just bring a lot of buyers and just create a lot of traction. So she just has really a cornucopia of infrastructure and ideas and the wherewithal to put all this stuff together to facilitate what lots of times could be a really stressful transaction to make it quite pleasant. Yeah. And she's just really, really good at, at finding solutions. <clears throat> yeah. She, we worked with her and we've worked with her in the past and man, knowledge, her knowledge base is unbelievable. Just the things that she knows like you said, her creativity and customer service is top notch. I mean, she, th she thinks about things that you, you wouldn't think uh, a real estate agent would be thinking about. So she's above and beyond. Her team is fantastic. Uh, she's mm -hmm. always got a really positive attitude. She helps you understand things, uh, good, bad, and indifferent. Uh, she tells you what your best options are. Just an excellent excellent real estate agent, but mo mostly I think what makes her most effective is just, she's fun to be around and she's just a, a very uh, pleasant person. So, uh, but she's won some awards, right? She's, she's, she's stacking them up, man. She's, she's, 
she's filling the house with those <laughs> those awards. So she's won like what what it give us give us the lowdown. Oh my goodness! I mean, we're gonna have to add on a room in the house to put all this <laughs> hardware. I don't know where we're gonna do with it. Uh, Maybe just start doing a certificate or something. Yeah. Um, no, she has won. I hope I say this right. I want to say it's the Jim Jackson award. Um, so it's a customer service award. Now she's had a lot of salespeople would maybe vie for the top agent in terms of most transactions or highest volume. And for selling in the neighborhood of 23, $24 million as a single party agent. Some people have teams in terms of buyers agents and all this. Uh, she does have some administrative assistant and people that do tons of work. Christy Dexter shout out. Cause without her, we could not do what we do. She's amazing, but she sells a ton of properties and that would be in and of itself. That's an accomplishment, but to have a hundred percent, you know, I think it's a hundred percent customer service satisfaction rating is basically what the Jim Jackson award is. And that is an award that is given to one agent out of about 40,000 agents nationwide. Wow. And so the way that comes about is when you have a transaction with her, there is a follow-up survey. How did we do? How was our communication? How did this thing go? How did that thing go? And it's an honest, you know, you fill that out in the privacy of your home and you submit it electronically. And she had a lot of people fill it out, which is one part of it. Mm -hmm. And, out of a high percentage of return surveys, they were all five stars. Mm. And, and for people like us that have to deal with people on a very difficult level sometimes because of the nature of the transaction and mm. all of the moving parts to get a lot of surveys back. And for those surveys to, for everyone to be happy is quite phenomenal. And so that's one of the awards that I believe she's the most proud of mm -hmm. is because a lot of people can sell a lot of real estate. That's, you know, you put a team together and you could sell 30 million pretty easily. Uh, but for one person to be in the mid twenties and to have very high customer satisfaction, that means the world to her. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, she's had top producer, awards, top agent, most transactions, et cetera. But I think having people being satisfied with their experience is the one award that she prizes the most. And I can see why I can see why she would get that as well. And you said a word there that was very uh, telling about working with her and honestly working with sound and church as well is, is experience. Because it is an mm -hmm. experience. It's not just an interaction or a transaction. It's an experience. And, and um, it's at a very high level. And now, before I ask you this question that I originally asked you and let you answer it, I want to ask you something about what you just said. Uh, because a lot of people that are listening to this are coaches, uh, business leaders, um, ministry leaders, so on and so forth. Um, I, I've, I've recognized something about working with you is... You ask a lot of questions and you value feedback. And then you were just talking about, you know, with her customer service award, that's how that process comes. Uh, as a business leader, as an entrepreneur, how valuable is genuine, true feedback to you? I mean, ultimately, that's, that's almost more valuable than a paycheck. I mean, obviously I can't pay the bills with a five star rating, mm -hmm. but if, if we do everything that is within the scope of work that's been discussed and for the price that we agree on and you're satisfied, then ultimately your satisfaction is, is our highest priority 
because what that does is that leaves a mark upon you. It leaves a mark upon our real estate clients and it leaves a mark that says this person is worth knowing. This person is worth doing business with. Mm -hmm. And I think that the world is just getting really full, unfortunately of people that are just sometimes not worth even being around. Mm -hmm. And that sounds real harsh, but it's like we're on the earth to do really good things. Right. And unfortunately there's just not a lot of people who have maybe fallen into or experienced the true potential that they have. And so part of what we're also called to that Jillian and I also love doing is that encouraging mentorship, Mm -hmm. believing in people, investing in people, because ultimately if we are surrounding ourselves by people who are producing. Okay. And I don't care if you're producing at a 1% level or a 110% level. I expect a 110% level, but Mm -hmm. some people's drive is very different than others. But if you are on a positive motion, Mm -hmm. right? If you are making positive movement, then you're growing. Mm -hmm. And if you're growing, then you're leaving behind a wake of results. Right. And ultimately that's, that's a pleasant experience. So I value, I think that every time that we do a project, whether it's a small project that happens in a day, or if it's a very large project, that's a interaction with architects and general contractors that takes years to do. Ultimately there should be a positive inflection that's left upon the people that we do business with. And even if we don't do business with people, right, there should be a positive inflection (laughs) that's left upon the people that bring our food to us. Yeah. Okay. The people that we interact with, like why would we not be anything other than, than positive? If we have Jesus living inside of us, if Mm -hmm. we have the power of the Holy spirit upon us, we are living a blessed life. So therefore there should be an overflow Mm-hmm. of that and yeah. not to get too spiritual i don't need to preach on you but that come on come on i mean it it kind of goes to that let's go fire up that organ yeah <laughs> <laughs> if i had one we'd be doing it uh oh I now, know. <laughs> now let, let me let me talk let's talk about that you know right now in in the business world and in the world in general in our culture i i i am in utter agreement with what you just said that just the negativity and uh almost just mean-spiritedness uh that exists Mm -hmm. um you know i know business is not i'm not naive and i don't think it necessarily should be i I know that sometimes business is very competitive but i think it can be done with Mm -hmm. the right attitude and the right mentality and i'm not saying don't be competitive i'm just saying man why do we have to be um so uh but, you know, we're so blessed. We're so blessed. Why Why do we have to at ever be negative to people or be hard to people or be hard to get along with? One of the things that I struggle with a lot of times with, with people just in leadership settings is, why do you want to be hard to deal with? <laughs> I don't understand yeah. it. What's the purpose Preach. behind it, you know? Um, mm-hmm. so, so when you guys get feedback... Uh, and it's probably not at this point in your careers, it's probably not as often as it may have been before. Um, but when you do get feedback that's negative or feedback that things didn't go as well as it should have or whatever, how, what do you walk, how do you take away, what do you take away from that as a leader? What do you do with that? Yeah, that's huge. Um, That's a great question there. I mean, I'm, I'm a human, right? I am, I am a sinner in a sinful world. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so while I strive for perfection in many areas of my life, I'm going to fail. I'm going to miss the mark. I want the times that the mark is missed 
to be a learning experience. Mm. If I don't take away from positive feedback, right? If there's a transaction where somebody's, listen, there's lots of times that people don't know this, but like we have to vent my wife and I, we have this process where we say, I'm just going to talk. I don't need a, (laughs) I don't need a fix. I'm the worst because if she communicates something that's like, (laughs) that's bad, I want to fix it. Like I'm a solution driven person. And sometimes she's like, look, hold on. (laughs) That's not what I'm asking for. I just need to say this. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's hard for people that strive for everybody to be satisfied because there are just some things that will be outside of our control. Mm. And for people that are usually in control, type A people like my wife and I, mm-hmm. we we desire for everybody to be a hundred percent satisfied. But I mean, ultimately, there I'm I'm a human dealing with another human. So if you're not a hundred percent satisfied for whatever reason, but I feel like I met everything that was in the scope that I provided then ultimately if you're not happy with something that wasn't part of the deal, then you're just going to remain unhappy with that. Mm -hmm. I'm, I don't know how to fix that because again, some people just choose to, to hold on to a negative disposition. Right. They choose to harbor a frustration a resentment or some people are just really, really hard to please. Yeah. And, Ultimately, whenever we're faced with a situation that is negative, I mean, my initial response is, you know, okay, so if we did something that we, if we didn't fulfill the task or if we missed the mark, I want to know how that can never be a missed mark again. Right. And so, uh, I had some feedback from a recent client about some, it was in a church and not all of the chairs were put back exactly how they were prior to our arrival. (laughs) Um, And there was some wood shavings from us drilling into a beam and some sheetrock dust. And my guys are pretty particular because I've expressed to them my particularness. Mm-hmm. of cleanliness, right? right? And I, they've seen me get the shop back out and clean up messes and they've seen me put chairs back together. Right. Now, is it, did I communicate to the church? Hey, I need you guys to move these chairs out of the way. Um, there's going to be some dust. We'll, we'll take care of it. Sometimes I do. Sometimes I don't, you know, I might've mm-hmm. missed communicating, Hey, move all these chairs out of the way so that we can get to where we need to get. Um, a lot of times like we'll put stuff back better than we found it. But you know, this, this particular person was a little missed uh, because he got some feedback from his parishioners. Uh, We paid this much money for this lighting system and they couldn't even put the chairs back. (laughs) And so honestly, like my first response is like, it's not my job to put the chairs back. <laughs> yeah, it's my job to clean up. And I apologize that that wasn't a, wasn't done in the manner of which you expected it. Right. That's not generally the case. A lot of times we're vacuuming around stages and stuff that you guys haven't vacuumed around in 15 years. <laughs> I'm sucking up dead crickets and stuff <laughs> that you guys could have done a long time ago. Oh, it's funny. But what's my response? I appreciate that, sir. I'm sorry that you experienced that. We will definitely make sure to address that. You know, it's interesting and, that you respond that way uh, because I, what I hear you saying is if we if we get something wrong, we need the feedback so that we can learn from it and get it right. But then as a business owner and entrepreneur, there are going to be people who are just not um, – going to be satisfied no matter what. And, you know, my being a pastor and leading in church ministry, my first response to something like that is whoever that person was that complained about that really, really, really needs something to do. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> cause I think I, but you know, it's a, a disposition, but as a business owner, 
you, you, you have to respond in a way that, um, well, reflects the core values of who you are, uh, and, sure. and, you know, doesn't hurt business as well. And so I think that's smart. Yeah. You, you don't always have to take that, but, but I think it's, it's smart to, um, you know, go overboard customer service wise. And, you know, you and I both know it doesn't matter what you do. There are some people that are not going to be pleased and that's just the bottom line. Yeah. And it probably, and to be honest, Jonathan, I have found this to be true in the 51 years of my life that a lot of times, a lot of times, mm-hmm. um, it has nothing to do with you <laughs> or the person they're working yeah. with. It has something to do with something else, but that, happen to be something that they could pick on. So anyway, you just have to work through. Yeah. You have to work through it and, uh, and just, you know, learn from it, I guess. So back to the subject of before I ask you those questions, what, so you and Jillian, you're, you're, you are, you know, getting after it, you're go getters. I don't know anybody uh, uh, that is more after it than you guys. Um, you're, you're seeing results. You're seeing fantastic things happen in your businesses and your companies as a result, which I think is a compilation of different things. I think it, it has to do with integrity. I think it has to do with, um, uh, professionalism. I think it has to do with knowledge, uh, and just passion, all of these things coming together. And, uh, this is why you're getting the results that you get, but this has to have, some effect on your family. And I know that there are a lot of people in the world today that are, that they feel like they have, it's a, they, they feel like it's a, a, you know, a, a, a choice that they have to make either. I'm going to have a great family and not do as well and be as successful, or I'm going to be really successful. And my family is just going to have to take the hit. And I, mm-hmm. I personally believe doesn't have to be that way. And so tell me what are, what's the greatest challenge that, that you face you and you and Jillian face when it comes to managing uh, business and family? You know, I don't think there's anything. I don't think there's any such thing as a work life balance, not for an entrepreneur. I think it looks different than that. So explain to us what, what you guys do and how you keep it straight. Yeah. Yeah, I I realize that my children are watching. My kids are watching what I do. My kids are watching what Jillian does. When we talk to people, they hear that. We're in the car, and either one of our phones ring. Guys, be quiet. We've got to take this. And I think ultimately, like, I'm... I'm being a dad, but I'm, I'm, I want to lead by example and I want my kids to be hustling as well. And so I, I feel a sense of responsibility to show them what it's like to work hard and to get your hands dirty, to not be afraid of saying yes to something and then figuring it out. A lot of times people are like, well, I've got to figure out how I can do this before I ever do it. And I'm like, nah, let's just say yes. Let's say, let's say, yeah, we're going to commit to that and we're going to see it through. Sometimes it takes some pressure to say, what are we going to do? How do we do this? But pressure creates diamonds, Mm -hmm. a piece of sand in a shell with pressure and time and consistent effort is where diamonds come from. Mm -hmm. And so my children are going to see some diamonds. They're going to see pressure. They're going to feel it and they're going to walk it out. And they're, I want my kids to be there with us as we do life, as we do business. And ultimately they are, they're investing in it, maybe unknowingly because they're 10, 11 and 13 at this point, right. you know, they're knowing what's happening. They know that mom and dad are busy, that we have stuff going on, but at the same time that spurs on a sense of engagement with them as well. And they're thinking about what can I do to 
make some money. I know I've got to pay for half my car when I turn 16. So what can I do? And they're coming up with all kinds of little things. Hold on, hold on, do. hold on, hold on. Uh, <laughs> I just want us to go over that one more time because I think this is a, an idea that used to be something that everyone did or most people did. And uh, nowadays it's just not done that way. So what you're saying is you require your kids to pay half their for half their car when they turn 16. Yeah. Yeah, I mean when I was young, <clears throat> uh, when I was 15, 16 years old, I actually had two vehicles before I even had a driver's license. <laughs> and now they weren't fancy cars. They were two beaters, you know, little <laughs> $1500 cars. But I had two vehicles. I don't know why really I had to, but I did. (laughs) And it was silly because I grew up super poor. I didn't grow up with anybody giving me anything. Mm. And so I valued those two cars. I valued the few clothes that I had. Mm. I valued everything because it was scarce. Nothing was in abundance. So at this stage, my kids live a very different life. And I tell them that, and of course they kind of laugh, they roll their eyes. Dad, you didn't really have an outhouse. (laughs) I actually did. (laughs) I had a working outhouse. Oh my God. Now it's crazy, but we've come a long way and we've come a long way from not spending every dime that we make. Mm -hmm. And we've come a long way by cherishing the things that we got because we had to make them last. And so I've told my kids multiple times, they each have savings accounts and they put their birthday money in the savings account. They might spend a small portion of it, but Mm -hmm. I mean, why? Yeah, we could, we could afford to buy the kids a a decent little starter car, Mm -hmm. but what's that going to do for them? If I just give them a car, right? Well, we know from experience that most 16 year olds are going to wreck their car. Mm-hmm. I did. <laughs> so both of them are just, one. there's going to be, well, <laughs> my stepdad at the time took one of them. I don't want to talk about that. Okay. But that was a whole other issue, <laughs> but I want to instill a sense of ownership and a sense of pride hmm. in them making the decision of how much do I want to put into this thing? Mm. Do I want to save $2,000 and get a $4,000 car or do mm-hmm. I want to save $4,000 and get an $8,000 car? Right. If I make the decision, if I make every decision for my children, I take away critical thinking skills. Mm. If I tell them what they're going to get, I take away choice. Yeah. And sometimes we have to limit choices. Other times we can create a, palette of choices for them to, to make their own. Right. And so I think that if you make them have some skin in the game Mm. and they will hopefully, I mean, my hope is, I mean, they're not driving yet, but my hope is that they care is that they have a sense of value Mm -hmm. in the things that they purchase, especially a car. It's going to be a large investment. It's going to be a big deal. And I want them to take care of that. Mm. And I get that it, they're going to wreck it. I get that there's going to be repairs and this kind of thing, but they have to start somewhere because we see in our culture currently that there is just a give me, give me, give me attitude. Mm. And the value, people are losing value on things that should be inherently value. Mm-hmm. And I just, I don't want that to be the case for my family. So that's why they're going to pay for half their car. It's good stuff, man. That's good stuff. The whole podcast is worth what you just said. And I agree too. I, I think that, I think it's one thing to say, hey, you know, you guys have it far better than we did, you know, and you just need to understand, you just need to be blessed by that. But it's a whole other thing to say, hey, this is your responsibility because you're not just giving them the opportunity to choose, but you're giving them the responsibility 
uh, to choose. And there's yeah. a big difference. My dad used to tell me on a regular basis and it stayed with me my whole life. He would say, David, you can't have the privileges if you're not willing to take the responsibility. And, uh, I think Come those, on. I think those lessons are really good because the world does not just move out of the way for you and give you everything you want. And it's unrealistic for us to set our, our kids to feel that way. And I know that it's almost yeah. trendy for kids to be like that today. But the truth is they're not the kids that are struggling with that are, are going to they're going to find it hard to be successful. It's going to take them a long time to get there. They're going to have to get up over a lot of mental limitations uh, because mm-hmm. they haven't. Uh, you know, they just have not I love the way you put we even on some decisions we can allow them to make, but then on other decisions, we can give them a palette of options and, uh, mm-hmm. you know, so we can guide their decisions, but they're still in that decision making process. Because the, the problem is we have so many young people that are looking life in the face and they do not know how to make an, a proper decision. And so uh, I think this is fantastic on so many levels. Yeah. So back to the idea of, you know, so what I hear you saying about, as it pertains to my question, I hear you saying that you bring your kids along, that you guys are entrepreneurial in nature and by trade. And uh, you bring your kids along into that because the values and qualities of that life you want them to to possess. So how do you maintain or manage just the life of your family in terms of um, not looking back and going, oh God, I wish we had more time, or I wish we had, I wish we had paid more attention, or you know those kind of things. We we you know we we succeeded in business, but look at our family, and you guys have a very successful family. So I'm wondering what are those principles, or even uh, just nuggets of of leadership that that you think is effective for that family life. Yeah. I mean, before I know it, my kids are going to be grown. I mean, my oldest were enrolling her in high school and that's just blowing my mind and shaking me, but I'm raising people. Like I'm raising small people (laughs) to be big people. Right. And I deal with big people that apparently didn't have anybody show them Mm. really what life is going to be like. Mm -hmm. And then these people maybe weren't, I don't know how to say this predisposed. I perhaps to just catching on. I feel like I had to catch on because that was the only option. Right. Right. Whenever, whenever I was 11 years old, I, my eyes were open to the fact that I didn't know my real father and the father that I thought was my real dad wasn't my dad. Mm. So I know that this wasn't healthy. I had, it took me till I was 30 to figure all this stuff out. But I was like, Oh my goodness, I'm responsible for everything at this point. I don't need to trust a a man because they've just let me down. Right. I'm on my own. So at 11 years old, I felt this sense of just, I got to produce, I got to make it work. Mm. Otherwise I'm going to be living the same thing over and over again. And I am thankful that God wired me in a way that I just, I got it. Mm -hmm. But there are some folks that have perhaps due to the nature of their parenting, the nature of their circumstances or otherwise, they just don't get it. Mm. And they're 35 and they're 45 and they're older that they just don't get it. Mm. And I, I expect my children to get it. And there's going to be some things that are going to take multiple t- times of trying and multiple communications of, son, you need to get this. Time to take the trash out. I don't want to have to tell you. But there is, there has to be a place where I have to allow, I've got to show like a teacher in grade school, she's going to open the textbook. She's going to show you the work. You're going to look at the problem. You're going to understand, you're going to be given the tools to come up with a solution. Mm 
Mm. Now, if you can't figure out the solution, we'll come over and help you. We'll mm-hmm. give you some additional aid. Right. Right. But there's an expectation that you learn how the formula works. Mm-hmm. And the formula is always the same. I think everything else is changing, but the method of finding a problem, putting or grabbing the tool to fix the problem and then coming up with a solution, this process can be interchanged in every facet of life. It can be exchanged in my daughter's dance class as they're learning how to do fuetes. It could be exchanged in the client realtor transaction of this is what's expected of you. And so this is what you need to do in order to buy this house. Mm -hmm. If you go out and buy a brand new car three months before closing, that's not going to (laughs) work. Things are going to fall apart. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and there's going to be some scenarios where it doesn't work. There's going to be some times where we're scheduled to show up to the church and there's a funeral, right? There are things that are outside of the realm of what we can control. But most of the time there are the part that I, that I see right now, like cognitively in my life Mm -hmm. is that we all see the problem. Mm -hmm. Okay. We all see that there's, there's a need to find a solution, right? So step two is you go to your toolbox and you get the tool, right? right? The tool could be critical thinking. The tool could be becoming debt free. The tool could be like, an assortment of valuable lessons that you might have to learn on the fly right? to come up with the solution, which is X, but the choice of grabbing the tool, it's lost for some people. Right. It's lost that there is even a tool shed to go to. Right. It's lost that there's even a screwdriver to grab. Right. And I don't want that to be lost on my children. I don't want it to be lost on the, on the people that are in my sphere yeah. that, that need somebody to say, look, you're not dumb because you don't know this. You just haven't been shown this. Right. So let's, let's go out there together. Let's open the door together. Sometimes though, the padlock is just rusted out, you know, Mm -hmm. and people, I just need to come along with bolt cutters and help somebody get access to that. Right. And so the analogy of finding the accessible tool is ultimately a key, I think, to unlocking the potential that we all have the potential to be solutions minded right. and generate things that need to be generated. But sometimes we just have a hard time finding our way to the she shed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, that's a very good analogy. And the truth is, you know, as leaders, it's our job uh, because, because honestly, and I'm going to come back to your kids in just a minute, but because honestly, we, we, as leaders, we can look at people and go, why, why, I don't understand why you're not just getting the tool and fixing the problem. What's the, but the truth is they legitimately may not have ever been given those tools. They, their, their upbringing or their environment, they they may not even know to look for the tools. They may just, I was in Africa one time and uh, there was a guy who'd been trained you know, in Western thinking and he was, you know, he had critical thinking and he knew how to solve problems and work things out. And, and he was leading a crew of people that were building a building for him. And it was, it was pretty, uh, uh, extensive, but he would get so frustrated because we would show up there and they would all just be sitting around. And so your first assumption <laughs> is these guys are just lazy and they just don't want to work and mm-hmm. they want to get paid. And they don't, but that wasn't the case at all. The case was just because of the way they had grown up and the way that they had been educated, that all they knew to do is when you come to an obstacle, uh, you wait until someone who's going to figure out what to do about it comes along and then they show you what to do and then you do it. And 
I mean, every yeah. day I was with him, he was mad. I mean, every day, you know, I just don't understand what the problem is, you know, and he was, he was just at, beside himself. And the truth is, as leaders, I, I love what Craig Rochelle says when he, he says, the first thing I do when if somebody's not getting it right is I ask a very simple question. Uh, did I lead them there? And I, I think that's something we all have to do. And it's what you're saying about your kids and the people in your circle of influence. You're not going to just let it go, but you're going to show them where the tools are. You're going to unlock the door for them if need be. You're going to walk them in. You're going to say, hey, here's what this tool is for. Here's how to use that tool. The 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 tool you're looking for that's going to, you know, open this or cut that or do whatever is right here. Let's go mm -hmm. over now. Let me show you how to use this. And that's what a leader does. That's what a parent does. And, um, yeah. so that's, that's, man, that's great insight. Um, so how, how do you make sure you get time with your family? What do you, I know your kids are in dance and they're in this and they're in that. I, I, I follow y'all on Instagram I'm stalking you. Um, but, <laughs> uh, how do you get time for your family to make sure that that doesn't go uh, away? Yeah, that's, that's golden. And spending time with my family, I mean, ultimately you have to go, my priorities are my family. Mm. And we get so wrapped up because the quantity of time that we spend working generally outweighs the time that we spend with family sometimes. Yeah. If you work a traditional eight hour job, right? Let's say that you get up and you have an hour or two in the morning and then you get home and say, there's another hour or two. That's still half the time. That's right. 50% of the time that you spend working. So the relationship that you have with coworkers or people that are around you is already greater and the time that you have with the people that you have brought into the world. Right. And it's just, it's got to be an intentional time. So there are certain measures that, that we try to establish once we get home and that's get off the phone, yeah. right? There is absolutely nothing on my phone, whether it's an email, whether it's social media, that is even close to being as important or as valuable as asking my son, what did you do today? Mm -hmm. How was your day? Tell me about this. And one thing that I try to do as a dad is that my kids have so much going on. I try to learn the names of their friends. And so I'll say, Hey, how, how's cash? You know, mm -hmm. what's, what's going on with cash? What's he up to? That's good. You know, or how's Kaylee? How's the, how's her parents doing? I haven't seen them lately. I want to, I just want to know. And I think it shocks. I don't get it right all the time, but you know, mm -hmm. there's, there's times where they're like, who are you talking about? And we, but for my kids to know that I'm thinking about their world. Right. You know, they, they see our world. They know that it's crazy. Mm -hmm. They don't, they don't know all the details, but for me to really care right. and ask detailed questions, I think that that helps. Right. And obviously I'd love to spend way more time with my kids uh, and my wife. There's, there's gotta be the absolute intentionality and you gotta say, like, I, I don't, need to be on my phone. I don't need to respond to that email right now. Right. It's hard because the entrepreneurial drive of following through customer mm -hmm. satisfaction right. and all these things, like I, I don't want to leave something not communicated about. And, but ultimately my family is more important than my work. Right. If it's not, yeah. then I'm messed up in the head. Yeah. One of the greatest compliments I, I, I got a couple of years ago, uh, Janae and I were on, um, <clears throat> we were supposed to be doing a marriage retreat in St. Louis and our, the time we were supposed to go out, um, 
our daughter, right around that time, she was supposed to give birth to our granddaughter. Mm -hmm. And, uh, (laughs) and it just so happened that she gave birth like right before we left. And so, um, so I'm, I mean, literally I pushed off one flight, pushed off another flight so I could hold that baby before I left. And so they finally, she finally, they finally got her out and I held her in my arms and, and Janae said, uh, there is no way I'm leaving. (laughs) So I went to this place and it was packed and we had a really great marriage retreat, but it was just me, you know, and I just explained to him and I kept putting up pictures of my new grandbaby and all this. But I say all that to say at the end, uh, at the end of the day, I, I honestly, the greatest compliment I received, you know, people usually come up and they say, man, it was great stuff, man. I learned a lot or whatever the case may be. But, um, this woman walked up to me and she said, I just want to say thank you that you are showing us that the things you just said are true and that valuing family is so important. The fact that your wife did not come uh, just spoke volumes to to me. And I thought, wow, Mm -hmm. a lot of times we think that people have this expectation and they don't care about such things, but really we're sending the opposite message. And so I think what you're saying is true. Like, why have we come to the place in our lives, especially in business and entrepreneurial things? You know, I have a coaching company as well as lead a church. And why have we come to this place where we think, and even ministry, even in ministry, yeah. that we, we think, I can't turn my phone off. I cannot uh, not answer an email. I can't return a text. I have to do that immediately. Uh, well, unless it's a crisis, why? What well, you know, why? Yeah. Is your family not your first level of ministry and your family, not the most important thing to you. You, you, you know, yes, we want to minister to people. Yes. We want a hundred percent customer satisfaction, but bottom line is none of those people are going to be, uh, you know, choosing the nursing home you're going into, you know what I'm saying? I mean, we, <laughs> we better be yeah. thinking about how we, how we treat those, the, those kids and those families because it's a generational man. And, you know, for whatever we want to say about, I'm not going to be like my dad, I'm not going to be like my mom. The truth is a lot of what we grew up in comes out in us. And so, you know, we get a shot at it and we should, we should hit the mark. Um, So I'm going to close with a couple of questions. I'm going to have you answer this. If you can do it in one word, if not uh, one sentence, just for fun. Uh, I'm going to ask you two questions. And uh, the first one is, what bothers you most about owning your own business? Mm. One word, right? One word. I know Mm. what my word is. Oh, I think I do. I think I know what it is. What is it? The, The one word that bothers me the most in my experience of owning my own business is pretense. Oh, that's a good one. That's not what I was going to say, but that's good. So define, explain that just a little bit. So I value the time that I have whenever I walk into a church, I'm there for a specific purpose and for a specific reason to do a specific task. And when I have to wade through unnecessary pretense, it's, it's frustrating, man. If I'm just being full transparent, say, say, say that, say that. Yeah. And and give me an example of that. I mean, don't give me a specific place. I'm just saying, give me an example. Uh, Yeah. And can you make sure you say the name and the city and, (laughs) (laughs) No, but you know, some people may not really understand what you mean by that. I immediately under understand it and identify with it. Kind of give us some clarity on what you mean by pretense and how that comes into play. So if you were to hire a plumber to unclog a drain, Mm -hmm. you're not going to have that plumber come in and, tell you why he's going to use a particular 
stainless steel coiled snake versus liquid Drano. Right. Right. There, you, if I am going to have a opinion on which tool the professional should use, then why am I not a plumber? Right. Why don't I do it myself? Right. Um, so that's sort of a specificity situation. Yeah. Um, but the other example would be, I have a passion. Like I would desire that every pastor or technical director or person that contacts me to come and be a part of their ministry. Cause that's ultimately how I feel about what we do is like, we're a part of your ministry. Like we're right. investing our time right. and driving to your church to do what we do. Like I'm all in. Yeah. I'm not like playing around doing this on the side. Like this is right. This is real. I'm accountable to God, right? right. On what I say to you mm-hmm. and how I conduct business and mm-hmm. what I invoice you for. I'm responsible to a higher power, not right. just you. Right. And so when a, when people wear their animosity or frustration or whatever in the form of pretense. Mm -hmm. I find that to be counterproductive to the overall goal that I have for you guys in Mm -hmm. terms of the church as I want to extend the reach of your ministry so that your worship services are not distracting. And so your pastor's mic isn't feeding back. And if you would just allow me to exercise what I believe is incommensurate value to your church, let me do that. Right. Don't, don't try to, and I get that it's hard because there's committees and there's people that really don't know anything about production per se that are making the, the decision on what we do. <laughs> and I, that's so true. I just want to have the, the clarity to be able to just function my skill set for you, mm. right? Without, you're not going to watch a new Star Wars movie and say, man, you know, I just really didn't like the way that music sounded. <laughs> no, Hans Zimmer is commissioned to make the soundtrack because he's the man. Right. Right. Exactly. Like he's good at what he does. That's all he does. Right. So just let me do all I do. Yeah. It's like, that's really all it, I have. Yeah. It's like your point to the plumber, like nobody on the committee is going, well, I want to make sure that the plumber is using the right tools that I, you know, the same tools I have at my house and, I really know a lot about plumbing and I re- nobody's doing that. But for some reason, you don't need to understand it. You just right. need to trust it. Right. Exactly. And stop <laughs> acting like you do understand it. Cause you don't know what Come you're on. talking about. Yeah. It's, I think it's a fear of getting, you know, outside the budget and a fear of, uh, doing things differently and all kinds of different things. Now, my one word was not nearly, as deep and, uh, you know, in really good as that. I just have one word, taxes. <laughs> that's my least, oh. that's my least favorite thing about owning a business. <laughs> I wasn't, I wasn't even going to try to wrap that in. That's for a whole nother podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We'll have to do that one next. Okay. The last one is, and this is a one word answer as well. Uh, what do you love about owning your own business? Mm. I love the responsibility. Mm. I love that the buck stops here. Yeah. It's my choice. It's my call. Mm. It's my decision. Right. I'm accountable and it's on me. Right. That's good. I, like I can't, that. I can't put the blame on the business owner. I can't put the blame on the CEO. I can't put the blame on the technicians. 
I can't put the blame on anybody else. If something isn't amazing, it's my yeah. fault. Right. Comes back but to you. The flip side to that, mm-hmm. the flip side of that though, Pastor David, is that when it's great, when it's beautiful, when it meets the budget, when it's on time, when it exceeds the customer's expectations, mm-hmm. it's also on me. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's very good. Great insight, brother. Thank you so much for spending this time with us. It really has been a a, a great conversation. A lot of people are going to get a lot of things out of it. And uh, we're, we're looking forward to having you and Jillian on and really talking about how you guys uh, make this all work and get some more good success principles from you. And so thanks so much for being a part of it. And I just want to say thank everybody who's a part of our leadership community for being a part today. Man, what what an incredible day and uh, some really good insights here from Jonathan Gardner with Sound in Church. And I hope you received a lot from that. And uh, you you know what? Uh, All the things are going to tell you here in just a minute. You can subscribe and do all that. Invite somebody else to be a part of our leadership community. Share this with someone who you think it could help. A lot of business leaders can really take a lot from this. So, Jonathan, one more time, thank you so much for being a part. And uh, God bless you so much, man. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. I appreciate you thinking of us. Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, with that, we're going to say goodbye to Jonathan and to you. Have a great week. And remember this, go out and add value to someone because the greater value will be added to you. Thanks for being a part of the Life and Leadership podcast all around the world. We have listeners that are a part of our leadership family in Nigeria, Sweden, South Korea, United Kingdom, and all over the United States. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcast, Overcast, Pocket Cast, Castro, CastBox, and Podchaser. For video version of this podcast, you can subscribe on YouTube. 